Hey there, it's time for Voice Over Body Shop, Tech Talk number 44. 44. 44. We're going we're gonna to put it down as 44. We're losing track here at the Voice Over Body Shop because we've just been doing so much. It's important that we bring you guys fresh content every week, which is what we try to do. That's what really matters. That's right. What's in a number? That's right. And But we've got lots of tech stuff to talk about, some really cool stuff like... What have you got in your tech update? Some stuff on Zoom and new microphone came out. Dealing with Zoom, eh, not that much. Oh, all right. Sibilance is the big thing we're going to talk about. That's yeah, that's going to be a fun one. So stay tuned for that. And of course, if you have a question for us on your home voiceover studio, it's something that you've been like, I don't know what this is about. I'll bet Dan and George know. Put it in the chat room, and and we'll make up something. Anyway, all that <laughs> coming up on Voiceover Body Shop. Tech Talk number four. And that's my dad's line. Oh, sorry. From the outer reaches, they came. Bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Whittem, the engineer to the VO stars. A Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master. A professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, making the complex simple, debunking the myths of what it takes to create great sounding audio, answering your questions, showing you the latest and greatest in VO tech, and having a dandy time doing it. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, J. Michael Collins Demos, when quality matters, and VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Yes. Tech Talk Tech number. Talk. Tech Talk. Now we need the echo. 44. <laughs> I know I can find that button somewhere. Let's try it again. Three, two, one. Tech, Tech talk! talk! It worked! Yeah, all right. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Uh, uh, Tech Talk. It's yeah, time. It is, because this is what George and I really love to do, and that is Talk Tech. And, of course, keeping it simple, we had Bo Weaver on last week, who we love because he has kept it so simple. Well, I love Bo because he's really gone, he's really gone to the edge of the earth and back in right. terms of not just physically traveling, but in terms of technology. Yeah. Because I've known Bo a long time. When I first met him, he had, you know, a pretty elaborate home setup, and he's reduced and reduced and reduced, and now it's just a mic, a scarf, <laughs> and a Mac, and Twisted Wave, and that is. Literally all he's using, folks. That is it. Right. So, because that's You can all. too. Yeah, and really, and that's what we're here for, to teach you to keep it simple. Because it's amazing how people obsess about certain things. Like, I gotta have this, I've gotta have that, and I've gotta do this, and I've gotta do that. Not necessarily. Uh, and we're here to dispel those myths. And we're here to teach you how to do it. And if you want to learn how to do it right, if you're you know new to voiceover and you're you know you finally found our show and where have you been the last nine and a half years, um, we got we got the information for you. And George and I love to teach it. If something's broken, we'll fix it because you know eat, we or, noticed today. For or instance, if you're using your microphones like these guys. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if you can really read that. But. If you don't know where to point your microphone, yeah, 
That's that's our help. job to teach you how to do that, you know. Or if by chance you're talking into the wrong microphone when you're like warming up for your show, and uh, <laughs> I don't know who would possibly do yeah. that. But uh, who recognized? Are you sure you have the right mic on? It's amazing how many. Why do I sound so far away? Because you're talking into the laptop's mic. You yes, know. ladies and gentlemen, I actually <laughs> did pretty much exactly that. You're you're allowed one a year. Once. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about it. I could have put her on a post-it note. Yeah, there you go. On with the date. Well, let's make sure. It's because I'm getting older. I just had a birthday, so yeah. give me a break. You don't know what old is. <laughs> yeah, you're just a kid. Anyway, uh, if you'd like to work with one of us, yes, we're this funny and we are this good. Uh, if you'd like to work with George and have him teach you or fix your setup or find out what's going on in there and make it sound the way it's supposed to sound, how would they do that? Well, we can go over to georgethe.tech, the domain that actually works, uh, thanks to my friend Brad Newman. Give me another pit plug, Brad, because you're awesome. Thank you. Georgethe.tech is where all my uh, my crazy website full of services and tutorial videos and on and on. There's a lot of resources over there, including getting a sound check, which is maybe the most important thing you'll spend $25 on uh, is a sound check. Get your audio checked out. And if, uh, if you want a second opinion, <laughs> get your sound checked by the other doctor. And that's over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Yeah, I've got my specimen collection cup for $25. I will thoroughly analyze your audio and see if you've got it right. You know, because if it sounds good, it is good. And a lot of times, like, you got a problem with this? Well, you know, I, I'm trying to make it sound a certain way. Well, you're not, you shouldn't be trying to make it sound a certain way. There's a way it's supposed to sound. And if you do it right up front, that's how you do it right, which is one, one of the things we do. But send me a sample, uh, use the specimen collection cup, and I will certainly give you a very thorough analysis about how it should sound and how close you are, and essentially what you can do to make it sound the way it's supposed to sound, the way it's supposed to sound like whistle. Anyway, so I, I had an interesting one this week, though. Somebody wrote to me and said, you know, we just remodeled our bathroom, which is right off of the, you know, my office where we're, you know, and we're like, and like they, they took the tub out of this bathroom and then they finished it and put a cabinet in there. And I'm like, why didn't we put a studio in there? So can't we do it in the bathroom there? And I wrote this long pause and I'm like, well, here's the truth about that. <laughs> Anyway, we can talk about that. Uh, I think I convinced them that perhaps it was not a good idea. I mean, it can be done, but is it worth it? I don't know. Will you still be able to use it as a bathroom? Too many hard surfaces. Too many hard surfaces. So what's in your tech update this week? Looks like a lot of cool stuff. Eh, well, you know, there, it's funny. I Normally this time of year, I feel like I get an injection of new stuff going on because of AES. Yeah. Um, AES show or whatever form that it was. I guess it was kind of was virtual last, this year. Yeah. Yeah. It was essentially spread out all, over the whole month, which I get why they would do it because it's virtual anyway, but it really took away the energy and the excitement of it. In fact, I, I tried to find anything that I was, that made me want to really be there whatever that means and there wasn't really that much i mean a lot of what aes is talking about which is the audio engineering society they're talking about really esoteric very high level audio engineering concepts live streaming surround mixing etc cetera, etc cetera. when i go to aes trade show i'm there to just cherry pick cool little things like a cool new mic stand dan and i did it one year we were was that the New York or the L.A. one? We that was that was the one at the L.A. Convention Center. Yeah, you know, and they're like, oh, you got you got to meet the professor, the guy with the ribbon mics. <laughs> was, Wes Dooley. Wes Dooley. turned to do an interview. Right. Look that up, guys. It's a good one. Wes Dooley. Um, yeah, it, it, it was kind of a, a letdown. It wasn't because it just didn't have that same feel. He couldn't walk the halls and discover things. So anyway, um, but our friends at Source Elements, they were there this year. They were presenting a... a um, a documentary they did a full like a 45 minute documentary 
about what it's about, produ- how to produce and them producing a commercial and doing it 100% all remotely. And it was a pretty big budget production. I mean, scoring, stage, music, the voice actor, the whole thing. It was really impressive. Um, hopefully they'll release that documentary to the wild. Right now it's it was an exclusive only at AES, but it was it was pretty awesome. Um, but one thing I'll talk about is in terms of new gear, again, not much that's been really exciting, but sure did uh, drop their MV7. Um, they have a line of of USB mics, curiously just called M- the MV series. Not sure why. Someone there could tell me, I'm sure. But they released the MV7. And what makes it interesting, really, is that it's it's the SM7B's cousin is... Well, it's kind of like the, if you took a, a traditional condenser USB mic, they have one called the MV51. Which is and actually if, a very good USB mic. It actually really is. We we did a big USB mic shootout several years ago at Wobocon. Again, that's on YouTube. Search for USB mic shootout. Wobo might be in the name. I don't remember. Anyway, they made they made a new dynamic mic that's sort of the the offspring of an SM7B dynamic mic, which we tell you guys over and over is not a good choice for voiceover. <laughs> it's very not sensitive. It's great to record Metallica's vocals, but not great at recording a sensitive storytelling voice. Not what that mic was designed for, but it's so popular because of podcasting and stuff. So anyway, they took those two and made this thing called the S- the uh, Shure SM7. And it's a USB large diaphragm dynamic mic, and it looks a lot like An SM7B. the SM7B, um, but it's like a smart SM7B. So... It has a software control panel, lets you adjust functions in the microphone. You can control the gain. You can control the monitor mix between you and the other side. Um, it's got some EQ settings, which harken back to the SM7B. Because, Dan, you remember how on the back, the mic, it had these little controls? Yeah, it's like two little settings back there. Yeah, it has a digital version of that. Now... I'm not saying you want to use all these things, but it is kind of nice to be able to engage a high pass filter. And that's one of the settings that the mic has. But I heard a sample of it. In fact, a good friend uh, of Bo Weaver's, Randy Brown, recorded some samples with it. And I'll have to say it sounded darn good. I mean, I I heard his voice in context with a Rode NT1 and a 416. And did it sound exactly the same? No. But it was not terribly different. It wasn't like this dynamic sounding mic. It sounded pretty high fidelity and it also was very low noise. It was not noisy and hissy. Hmm. So I don't know, who's this mic for? Clearly podcasting and webcasting is really who they built this mic for. But if you want to try yet another USB mic, give it a shot. Maybe you'll find some reason it's the next best thing since sliced bread for voiceover. Maybe it's a great travel mic because it is a dynamic mic. So maybe it's going to be less susceptible to background noise. For $250, it's worth a shot to play around with it. Maybe I'll get one of these one of these days and try it out. Yeah. That's the Shira MV7. Yeah. $250 for a USB mic. It's got to be a little better than, say, some of the other ones that, you know, that are considerably less cost. It's Uh, a very similar price range to the Apogee Hype. Maybe it's a little bit cheaper. And it's the same concept where there's some processing built in with which has varying reasons to use it or not using it use it <laughs> but it does have those features right uh, um, what about the yeah. zoom in the apollo what the heck's going on with that yeah so so folks who are used to the simplest the simple life <laughs> you know the easy the simple life of using the likes of the scarlet 2i2 the steinberg the ag03 even you know, some of these audio interfaces, there's, we can name a hundred of them. They, they, they graduate to the Apollo because they hear about it from all these other voice acting colleagues. They hear it's the next best thing. In fact, they're even hearing, I'm even hearing that studios are saying, we expect you to have something of that price or that quality as the Apollo. So it, it's become kind of a new bar of like whatever, a new measure of quality, like a Neumann mic. 
So the problem is, is it's not nearly as simple to operate and use day to day as something like a Scarlet. Right. And one of the things that makes it a nightmare for a lot of people is its inability to want to play along properly with Zoom. And it's it's one of those, well, whose fault is this really? Is it <laughs> Zoom's fault or is it Universal Audio's fault? And at the end of the day, it's just the problem of developing a tool with music production in mind, which has a tremendous amount of audio input and output channels and tons of features. And on the other side, Zoom, which was designed for anybody but music production people. It was designed and for grandma. Right. <laughs> and, and then cramming those two worlds together and things don't get along. The problem is, is what Zoom does, it's weird. And this, I got to, if you're, if you're a Windows Zoom Apollo user, let me know. Put a note in the chat room or in the, in the comments. If, that, if you have all this work and let me know. I don't know if anybody does. But I'm talking about mainly Mac. Um, it doesn't play back audio the way you expect it to. It doesn't come back into the Apollo where everybody else is sending audio back in. So that throws you off. It doesn't maybe, you expect it to come out of your headphones. It doesn't. It comes out of the speakers. It just does weird things. But also on the input side, what's really weird with Zoom is what they did with Zoom is they said, well, we're going to make Zoom listen to every channel on your equipment, on your interface. And I think they did that to make sure, to to ensure that no matter where somebody stupidly plugs their mic in, let's say they have a, I don't know, a four channel mixer or a four channel Scarlet, 4i, 6i8, I don't know, one of those more complicated ones. If you plug the mic into channel three, it's still going to be audible in Zoom. And that's the way they designed it. And that's, I get that, but man, when you have something like an Apollo, the Apollo is sending audio out on multiple channels at the same time, all the time. It's sending it out on the direct channel for channel one for the mic. It's sending it out sometimes on an aux channel if you have that set up for playback. And it's sending it out on a monitor mix or a main mix. And Zoom's hearing all that at the same time. And you get this funky, weird, phasey sound out of your Apollo if you're on uh, if you're on Zoom. If you're you're not going to hear it, but the person on the other end is going to hear it. It happens all the time. I'm connecting to people doing support on Zoom, and I don't even have to know they're on the Apollo. As soon as they speak, I hear that telltale sound, and I know they're on the Apollo. So th this has been so frustrating, and there are workarounds. Trust me, there are plenty. But right now, I've actually um, I've got a couple of my uh, tech people that I network with regularly, um, Tim Friedlander of Soundbox LA, who's an Apollo nut, he is working on this with me, as well as near and dear to our heart, Hat Merlino. I reached out to him because he's a young brain that isn't so addled by all this stuff yet. <laughs> you know, and the more I think about and dig into the how these things interact in the computer, I get I get tired. Like it's literally exhausting. I mean, imagine. You guys, I can't imagine what you're dealing with. But Hat is like, yeah, he's like a sponge, you know? He's in his 20s. Let me at it, you know? And then Tim, he's like an Apollo nut. And he, so anyway, we're working on the ultimate free way to use this special plugin called Black Hole to make all these things work together without buying other software and without buying other cables and interfaces and workarounds. So soon we'll have that. We're going to produce a video and put it up and we'll have it on YouTube. And all you Apollo guys and gals can watch this. And hopefully uh, we'll have an end to this madness, <laughs> you know, where everything works the way it should. So there, right. there are ways to do it with some, an app called Loopback, um, which is a really powerful application. It's pretty impressive. But it's a $100 app. And just to buy an app to fix one problem with zoom just doesn't just doesn't make sense so black hole is sort of soundcloud for catalina do you remember soundcloud no not not soundcloud soundflower oh yeah remember that thing oh yeah it was a routing software yeah. yeah and it's been around forever but they stopped updating it years ago and when catalina came out it pretty much blew up so this other developing team came out with black hole it's a very similar idea 
And so that's what they're going to, that's what we're working on. So I say we, they're pretty much doing all the thinking. Yeah, you got I'm other things make to the do. Video. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's my update for, for the week. So all right. I wanted to talk next about, um, well, Dan, actually, Dan brought up the idea of talking about sibilance. Yeah, because... I think it's a good one. We haven't really talked about that. No, because, you know, I get a lot of, you know, emails from people and they say, I sound sibilant. And some people sound more sibilant than others. And they're like, yeah. should I get a different mic? You know, I, I tend to think that sibilance is far more of a physical thing than it is that has anything to do with the microphone. Um, people like say, well, if you talk off axis, it will get rid of sibilance. You know, first off, what is sibilance? Sibilance is usually a, uh, an, an accentuated S or T sound, uh, in the upper range of over 10 kilohertz and sometimes a little lower sometimes than that. lower. Yeah. You can get a, you can have a shh sound. Yeah. It's essentially an overmodulation at that frequency. And what causes that? Is it the sensitivity of the mic? Or is it something that perhaps that person, the way that person talks? And, you know, some people, well, I'm very sibilant. Well, yes, you are. Is there a microphone that's going to fix that? Probably not. not. Entirely. No. no. It, to me, generally, it's a thing. It's all about mic technique. Uh, you know, sometimes people are sibilant because they're too close to the mic. Uh, they are, you know, talking directly into the diaphragm. And they say things like, uh, you know, silly, silly things about silly things. And if you do it too close to the mic, depending on the sensitivity of the mic and the frequency response of the mic, you're going to get some sibilance. If you back off the mic and from the proper distance, and of course we've talked about, you know, what is the proper distance to be from the mic? Well, it depends on the environment you're in. If you're in a small booth, you want to be a little bit closer. But still, you do not want to... I find it's from people over projecting their voice, which is not something you should be doing. You should be, you know, being a, a as a voice actor, forget the microphone is there and play to the copy and not try to get, you know, an over enunciate everything. And that's generally what causes sibilance. Um, no, I'm yeah, your voice is an instrument. That's right. You so have to learn how to play. Control it, and absolutely. Some instruments have qualities that you have to change. You have to you have to perform differently to adjust for that. You know, so you have to learn that about your instrument. And if it means you have to back off on the S's or how much air you or how much projection you're putting out, you can learn that. Absolutely. Well, and as as a professional voice actor, it'd be incumbent upon you to train yourself to do that, because. There's not there are there technological fixes for it. Sure, I mean, you can talk about that. I mean, there's there's some great tools in, in Adobe Audition that you know you can like narrow down you know where that is. Or actually, one of the things I'll do if somebody sends me something and I'll like, is it worth fixing? But you can like highlight where you see, you know, a, a hot frequency, and then in just the spectral sort of, view. Yeah, in the spectral view, and just sort of lower the volume on it. Mm -hmm. But it's better if it's not there in the first place. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's some microphones that will amplify or essentially boost the, the frequent, the sibilant range. In fact, a lot of condenser mics are kind of known for that because they're not designed to be accurate. They're not really designed to be flat. They're designed to sort of enhance the voice or make the voice sound kind of pop up above the din of the other instruments, right. you know, in a mix of music. And so the microphones are designed to do that. Well, unfortunately, that also will often boost sibilance. And a lot of the shotgun mics, especially the 416, some of the others, they naturally have a pretty big boost in that range. So if you already have a propensity for that problem, those mics are going to make it even worse. Um, yes, you can do technique, you can do uh, rotate your large diaphragm condenser mic more off axis. And as you go more off axis, you start losing the treble range. But that's really challenging to get right. The sweet spot is small. You do it too much. Now it sounds like you're speaking through some wax paper or something. You just <laughs> lose all the top end. Right. 
you know. So it's it's not my favorite thing. DSers, some companies invest a lot of R and D into the perfect DSing plugin. I think the one in Audition works fine. Like yeah. it's it's I put it on broadband mode. Maybe three thousand hertz is the width of the the width or whatever setting, and I just slide it around until I find where that frequency that jumps out at me, and then I slide the threshold to the, to the left until it smooths it out. But you go too far, and it sounds odd. Yeah, you gotta be really careful with DSers. Yeah. So so essentially, learn to talk without. Uh, the thing is, is when we talk to people, we don't sound sibilant to people. Unless you're like really have an annoying voice or something, uh, but uh, generally, it, if a micro a microphone's going to pick you up as you exist, so give it your best as far as how you normally talk, and not try to over enunciate. Really push your s's. Learn to relax your tongue, and I find that usually relieves sibilance pretty good. Because I use a four sixteen, I don't have any problem with sibilance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know. yeah, I, it's. It varies from voice to voice. There are just some mics that, if you look at the frequency spectrum, and it'll have like these little boosts in the upper frequencies, sometimes those little peaks are exactly the wrong frequency for that voice. Yeah. All really jump yeah, out. Yeah. Also, it'd be, it should be mentioned that people say, I sound sibilant. My first question is, what are you listening to the playback on? Right. I sound sibilant. Right. So that is a very, very important question to ask. Yeah. Uh, there are headphones out there that are notorious for making sibilance, like exacerbating it, like actually uh, exacerbating, exaggerating is maybe a better word. Well, it, but just a little of both. Worse. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's what that means. Is that a Yogi Berra thing? Uh, well, well, I don't know, whatever that is. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I one of those is the Sony MDR seventy five oh six headphones. Those are notorious for being right. So that's uh, the first thing they usually ask somebody when they say they think they sound really sibilant. I'll ask them what are they monitoring on, right? And sometimes that will influence my you know my thought. But I'm still going to be listening on the same headphones that I listen to, the same you know that I listen to people's voices on day after day after day after day. I know these headphones, I know my ears, and I know what should be there and what shouldn't be there. So trust trust us. Like if you send your audio to Dan or I and we tell you it's not sibilant. It's not sibilant. It's not sibilant. <laughs> if the client says you sound sibilant, that's a different situation. Now you're trying to please a client. And even if they're wrong, guess what? The cost yeah. customer is always right. And sometimes we got to you know, there's some extenuating circumstances. We may have to do some EQ right. or muck around with a DS or, but generally, you know, we, we know what sibling sounds like and we'll tell you if it's really there or not. Right. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is generally it's probably in your playback or your actual hearing. If no one says anything about it in your book and work, then it's not really there. You know? Oh, you know, it's really sibling is mm. the playback on like laptop or iPhones. Oh yeah. Oh, Absolutely. You know, those little tinny speakers really make sibilance jump out of you. Which so is where most auditions like, are being listened to on. But. Yeah, and I play it back on my MacBook and it sounds sibilant. I'm like, well, oh, yeah, that's not a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> so Alrighty. Be aware of that. Yeah, so that's our take on sibilance. All right. Well, we got a lot of questions from our amazing audience out there. So we'll... This is the best part. We will dive into those right after this. Hello. Welcome to Voice Over Body Shop is a place where you can get your body shopped with voices. Come on, look at Dan's head. So shiny. Well, we may not be traveling a whole lot, but if you are, and you gotta be able to record on the road, here's the way to do it. With a Harlan Hogan Porta Booth Plus Easy to handle, easy to get onto a plane. It fits right into a luggage rack, no problem. And more importantly, the Porta Booth Plus is made with real Oralex. Not that fake stuff you get at Banjo Emporium. This is specially made to make sure that your sound is just right when using the Harlan Hogan Porta Booth Plus. Where can you get one? 
Very easy. Go on over to voiceoveressentials.com. That's voiceoveressentials.com. Look on their front page. You'll see the Porta Booth Plus and the Porta Booth Pro at voiceoveressentials.com. Voiceoveressentials.com. Get your Porta Booth Plus now. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? Stick around. You don't want to miss this. Look what you made me do. Power 103.9. At Target, we want you to come as you are. Be comfortable. Uh, okay, maybe not bathrobe comfortable. Pants for the customer in aisle four, please. Nuevo México necesita un cambio. La representante Michelle Lujan Grisham ha luchado por nuestro estado en la Cámara de Representantes. Watch anywhere, anytime on an unlimited number of devices. Sign in with your Netflix account to watch instantly at Netflix.com. The ice cream maker is a big risk that can have huge rewards until you forget to turn it on. Well, that's it, guys. Time is up. Hey, it's JMC. Thanks for watching the voiceover body shop. If you're demo ready or looking to get there, check out jmcdemos.com and see a sample of our work. Now let's get back to Dan and George and this week's tech wisdom. Hey everybody. It's that time of the show where we get to talk about our fantastic, wonderful, amazing sponsors, source elements, the creators of source connect at this point, you have to know what source connect is. My gosh, all the agents are nagging you to get it. Um, even if you don't have an agent, maybe consider having it ready to go. So when you're asked for it, you can say yes. And what does that mean? You go to source-elements.com, get a 15-day free trial, but you can even wait to activate your trial. You can sign up, get your account going, get your iLock account set up, have all the pieces in place, and then wait to activate your 15 day free trial to make sure that it doesn't expire by the time you need it. But it gets better than that. If you have had your 15 day free trial and you let it expire, don't worry. There's now two day passes. So you can activate your source connect for just that gig and just basically pay for the time you actually need. So you really can't go wrong. There's no major commitments anymore. No subscriptions. If you don't want to go that route, you do have that ability to just activate it and use it for a day or two. So it's a no brainer. Be ready to use Source Connect for that big gig that comes down the line, which is happening more and more these days, thanks to working remotely and sign up at Source Dash Elements. And if you have a chance to tell them we sent you, would you do that? That'd be awesome. I'll be right back right after this. And we're, and we're back, back. here on Voice Over Body Shop Tech, tech Talk. talk over. What? What is it? Is it? <laughs> what? Oh, I'll cut the speakers. There we go. Now, now does it sound okay? okay? Test, Test one, one, two. two. Why I don't know. Something, 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 something needs, needs to be checked, checked off, off there. Oh, it's oh, still it's happening? happening? Yeah. 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 Hold on. One, two, three. Oh, well, that fixed it. Okay. It's like the old days where I have to manually mute the speakers when we come back from yeah. the break. <laughs> okay. And there's the edit point right there. Okay. Well, okay. We're back here at VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk number 44. Uh, God, we've been doing this a long time. But we still have stuff to talk about because people have questions. Because there's just so much to know. And it comes down to real simple stuff. So why don't we start uh, start on those? Go for it. All right, right off the top here, we yeah. have uh, a question from Bob Leadham, Bob, Bob Lee. Leadham in Philly. Um, right. There's lots of info to be found on AV software for Mac. Everybody's list is a little different. I guess it depends on who you ask. Is this a good idea? Not necessary? Paid? Free? Usual suspects? Which ones? Yes. Okay. First, yeah. I have to remember what, <laughs> a, what he means by AV. So. My brain goes to audio no, visual. visual. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. But after I read the whole thing, I realized what he's talking about is antivirus. Ah. Uh, so Dan, I think at one time you ran an antivirus on your Mac. Do you still do that? There's something on there. <laughs> uh, you know, I you know I'm not you know. There's probably Russians listening in. Oh, now do we get to it going to his computer? Uh, but uh, no, I yeah. Macs generally, you know, they're they're pretty safe. 
And uh, but you know, you got your Nortons, you got your all this other stuff. Um, Malware bytes. I think that's the one that I've heard more often than anything on yeah. the Mac side is malware bytes. Right. You know, that's when I've heard people like. Yeah, I mean, it's I'm not using it. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it, it, I mean, what do you use on yours? I mean, nothing. Exactly. Here's here's the here's my attitude on the whole thing. First of all, anything that properly protects your computer, it has to be constantly monitoring Doing it. Yeah. So that means it's putting a load on your system. It's monitoring the incoming traffic coming into your network, which means it gets in the way of things sometimes. And it just keeps your computer busier. And there's just so many more opportunities for problems to occur when your computer is being used to record anything real time, audio, video. And so to me, those they become more of a problem than a solution. I'm more of into like keeping your system fully backed up and even having like a what's called a clone. So like if you really can't afford to be down because of a virus, you can boot the computer back up from a clone, a, another hard drive that's an exact duplicate of your system. It may not have the latest files on it, but it has everything you need to get back up and running. I really think that's a better solution than constantly looking out for every possible little threat that comes into your system. I, I know folks in Windows, that's de rigueur. I mean, that's just, Windows systems are being attacked constantly. Right. Um, Mac systems, there are occasionally a viruses or two that come out or, or an exploit, but it's so rare in comparison. So yeah. I'm not a big fan. I don't I don't use it. But malware bytes, that's what I hear people like. All right. Well, makes sense. You know, I mean, I've I haven't really I don't think I've ever really been infected before. You know, be, you know, you take care of your your computer, it will take care of you. You know, one of the worst way, the, the, the most common way that people get infected that I'm aware of is through their email. Yeah. And if you don't use a traditional email application like um, Apple Mail, but you use cloud email like Yahoo or Gmail or Hotmail, you're way, way, way less likely to get bu uh, stung by a virus. Yeah. Because it's, you know, that the, everything's still in a server in a cloud. You'd have to then download an application from your email, save the attachment, and then run it. Right. And it's just far less likely you, you're going to do it. Doesn't mean it can't happen, but someone you're, you're less likely. Out. Yeah, at least those guys know what they're doing, and they're looking out for us. Uh, Jeff Holman asks, "Hey Jeff, hey Jeff, uh, I'm looking at buying a new Mac. Excellent. I do both voiceover and on-camera work. Is it more important to have a faster processing speed or more processing cores?" Does the iteration of the processor matter? An i5 versus an i7 versus an i9. Some say a new Mac Mini is being released next week and it may have a new ARM Apple Silicon chip processor instead of Intel. If they did and it had the new Apple Silicon chips instead of the Intel, would you be tempted to hold off buying one? Like you hold off upgrading to a new operating system or application version until it's been vetted by you uh, or hardware... <laughs> Or is it hardware? Is hardware not like that? I would tend to think that, you know, it's going to work. And is it going to the possible incompatibilities with some hardware? But generally not. What do you think? That yeah, I'm I'm still I'm always going to be the guy that says don't buy the newest bleeding edge right. model of a computer. Um, I guess let me let me say go ahead and buy it but don't like immediately make it your production computer like don't say oh right I got my new Mac the other one's going on Craigslist okay it's buy it's gone like don't do that <laughs> keep your other system online and running reliably as it hopefully is now um maybe it's not and that's why you're looking to buy a new one but um definitely don't make that new machine the your production machine right away got to get everything installed on it test it with all your software make sure your hardware is working and compatible with it and that's one factor the other factor when that new mac mini with silicon comes out um it's going to have big sur so it's going to have a new operating system as well as being a whole new system architecture a lot of variables a lot of variables you're you're really still better off i know it's so exciting to get the new thing and you want to 
you're buying a new computer, so why would you buy something last year or even last month? It's just not smart. It's just not a wise way to go for people that are using their computers for production. That just it's really more about the productivity and the reliability and less about the performance. Yeah. In terms of cores versus speed, the thing you're gonna notice more is speed and not the number of cores. Because the reason is most software is not written. Software has to be written to support multiple cores. So most software isn't written for multiple cores. It ignores the fact that you have six cores. It only uses one. So you're not going to notice a, a, if it's like a six core machine and it's a two gigahertz clock, you're better off getting a four core machine with a three gigahertz clock because that's what you're going to notice day to day to day. Right. And, and, um, but Jeff does a lot of video work too, which is a little bit more memory intensive. Video work, yeah, video work will matter more because if you're using Final Cut, Final Cut on a Mac is written to, to, to juice, squeeze every last bit of juice out of your Mac and it will use every bit of memory and every core on that machine. So in that case, the more core count will, will matter. Now, again, it won't matter most of the time. It'll only matter when the computer is rendering files. So if you do the stuff for a living and you're like, burn in time because you're waiting for your computer to spit out a video, then the, the more core, faster machine's gonna matter. But yeah. for a vast majority of you, it won't really make a big difference to you. You won't really notice a big difference in performance. All righty. All right, why don't you take this one from Jay Horace Black. Okay, hey Jay. We all know Jay, he's yeah. been a fan of the show a long time. Um, hey guys, great to see you. Uh, what's, George, what's your opinion on the MicPort Pro 2 with the limiter for voice over and on camera use for a one stop shop. I've been using the Mic Port Pro 2 with limiter on my on camera self tape submits with my iPhone Pro 11 Max. That's a pretty awesome rig. Yeah. Um, either my 416 or my, uh, my 875 shotgun mic. Um, recently, I've had to do a lot of, uh, I've had a lot of actors that do both on camera. And voiceover ask me which one I suggest. And I've been suggesting the MicPort Pro 2 with a limiter and also have the Hue lights all over my house connected to a Google <laughs> mini speaker. So I just say, hey, hey Google, Google. <laughs> turn on my studio lights. And she does. I, and I also like uh, say the specific color and she does. It's fun. <laughs> I can't wait until the new Apple home speaker comes out in a few weeks to replace the Google mini. Well, Jay is a total tech nerd. I love it. <laughs> he loves the tech. There's a lot to unpack in there, but I think the main gist of it is, is the MicPort Pro 2 with limiter good? Yes. By all accounts, it's awesome. Um, do you need the limiter? Most, If you set your gain correctly, you don't need the limiter. And nowadays, we record in 24-bit, and we record with a lower gain setting, so we have a lot more headroom. That's really what a lot of uh, producers want. They don't want levels that are really, really hot. They want to have a lot of dynamic range and a lot of room. So the limiter is less important than maybe it might have been. But it is kind of nice if you're doing, if you're trying to get something that sounds more finished and you want to record with higher levels, that limiter is kind of cool because it will give you a higher average RMS level. You'll give you a higher recording level on average. So. It depends on what you're doing and the purposes of doing it. If I was using one, I would have the limiter just on. It's just a safety measure and it doesn't do anything to the quality of the audio. It doesn't do a damn thing until the level gets very close to clipping. So most of you, even if it's on, will you never even know it's on. You're never gonna even notice it. So yes, MicPort Pro 2, great. Good product, very clean, very transparent. Yes, and it is pretty much a one-stop shop. Use yeah. it with your iPhone, use it with your Mac, your PC, voiceover, video, whatever. Podcasting. It's, it's a super versatile thing. Absolutely. Podcasting? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Mark Bonnier. Hey, guys. I have a very newbie question here. How in the heck do I boost audio correctly? I record at about minus 18 to minus 12 dB, but I need to get it to ACX standards at say minus 3.2 dB. 
I'm asking because I'm getting mixed answers about normalizing and that I should not use normalize. Then there's the whole compression world and then the limiters. I really want to nail down a process that produces a clean sound without fiddling too much with processes. At the moment, I'm using Reaper, set up for voiceover, just like the great Mike Del Gaudio. Well, how do you get your audio right? I always say it's based on these three things. Get your acoustics right. Keep audio from coming, you know, sound from coming into the space you're recording in and prevent it from bouncing around. It's a whole discipline right in there. Two, proper microphone technique. Don't, don't talk too close to the mic. Don't talk directly into the diaphragm. Learn proper mic technique and setting proper levels. If you listen to what other people say about this, don't listen to them. Uh, there's, yeah, because you're getting so much different information from people. It just shows that it doesn't really matter except what we consider the standards for what is proper input. Now, as you were saying, because we're recording in 24-bit, we don't necessarily have to punch it quite as hard. But you want to be modulating at least to uh, above minus 12 to minus 9 consistently and then peaking you know, up to minus six, between minus six and minus four, and try not to go all the way to three. And that's going to give you a nice yeah. clean signal all the way across. If for so, any reason, it's just more practical. Exactly. It's harder to monitor and hear the audio if it's recorded really low. <laughs> exactly. And then yeah. if you have to raise it up and normalize it to get it at the proper level, you're going to start getting a lot of hissing and stuff like that. So in order to not fiddle with it too much, do it right up front and forget about all these processes. If you got it sounding right initially, that's going to save you an awful lot of work. And you go with the processes that ACX gives you, not suggest. You see, I love the guys at ACX. Like, yeah, you got to process it to this or that. But they don't really explain it very well. And so if they would just give the settings that you should use and do that, do that. Don't make this stuff up for yourself. And if you're trying to do it to satisfy your own ears, just realize that you don't hire you. Uh, and so it's important that you try to get it right up front. Let us, George or I, listen to what you're doing. And if we think there's things you can do physically to make it sound better, that's going to save you a lot of work on the back end. Yeah, I mean, here's the problem with the whole ACX idea is that they're asking you to submit audio that has a certain spec, certain peak level, certain average level. That's not how it's recorded, though. That's the mastered or the finished version of the audio. And people get that confused all the time. So the way you record it versus the way it's delivered for meeting their requirements so they can put it on Audible are two totally different animals. And there are very specific workflows and techniques. I have my own for, for getting audio ready, and ma it's called mastering. How to master it so it meets those standards. That has nothing to do with how you record it. You know, I guess everything Dan said is true. If you're not getting great audio to start with, the mastering is just going to make it sound way worse. Um, but there is a workflow. There's a process. And depending on who teaches you how to do it, they're going to use different methods. My method definitely includes normalizing, compression, limiters, the whole deal. Um, I recommend that if you really are going to be producing audiobooks, you have mastering setup done for you. I do it as a service at georgethe.tech. You can get an audiobook mastering process set up for you. I will set it up and teach you how to properly do this. Um, but it's not about... It's not about making it sound a certain way. It's about the quality being good to begin with and then making sure the audio meets those specific standards for ACX. So anyway, right. <sighs> talk about it a lot, ACX stuff. And it's, uh, it's, it's bewildering to many because it seems to be an entry point for a lot of people to the voiceover world. Right. As they come in through ACX and it, it's a great thing that they've made this available to publishers or, or authors, really not publishers, but authors um, and to, to narrators and make them be able to meet each other. But the details, oh boy, the devil's really in the details with, with doing this kind yeah, of work. Yeah, just saying you have to do stuff is not the same as knowing how to do it. 
it's uh, you know, and it's it, a lot and of work. It's and and it's and it's a learning curve. You've got to learn what it's supposed to sound like and and when you're going off the course. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's really important. Uh, here's one for me. This is uh, from from Jeff Holman. He says, "I've I've read a lot of audiobook narrators like to work sitting down in front of the mic." Dan, you've done more than a few audiobooks. Yeah, I did about 40 titles. Uh, do you ever sit when you work? How about for commercial voiceover work? This is one of those, eh, what do you feel like? You know, I have found that, you know, sometimes they say, well, you stand when you do voiceover, so you're supporting your diaphragm. Except that when we're talking to other people, we're not really supporting our diaphragms. <laughs> you know, we're, we're just, hey, what's going on, you know? When you tend to, you know, if I, I do it standing up depending on the type of read it is. And, you know, because I match your energy level and it, and it has to do with your energy level. Sometimes for audiobooks, you know, I would sometimes I would sit. One of my favorite things to do is I had, you know, I've got my my stool here somewhere. I always lean on the stool, you know, and I could get up and move and, and that sort of thing. As long as you're comfortable. Because um, you're going to be in that place for a long Long, long time. time. <laughs> right. You know, I tend to get leg cramps if I sit too long. So, you know, I I don't think it makes a difference. It's knowing what your voice sounds like. If you're sitting, does it sound strained? It's going to sound like you. Uh, and if you're standing up, I mean, I, I could demonstrate this, you know. Are, are you going to hear a difference if I'm, if, I, if I'm standing up or something? So here I'm standing up. You're looking at my gut here, but uh, if I'm standing up, does that change anything from You're a when I'm closer to the mic? So that's the biggest thing. Right. That, really that's really do. it. And but if you you stand up and you you back off the mic, you know, again, it's it's just a matter of projection. And if it's if it's a hard read, if it's you know car commercial, come on down to, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, you might want that support, but if it's a subtle conversational type of read, you know, where you're just talking to somebody and you know, and you want to talk about, hey, can we talk about, you know, that sort of thing? It's not a whisper; right. it's an indoor voice. Right. Yeah, you can sit. So it really depends yeah. on what the read is. Matches the, the, the matching the energy. Yeah, right. It matches the energy, but it's also sometimes purely a practical choice. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I have clients that have booths that don't sound very good when they stand up. Exactly. Oh, it's they amazing. Have to sit down. It's amazing you know, how how you know the level depending on where you are in the booth or something, it will change it. Mm -hmm. And it can sound much better when you sit down sometimes. So you yeah. have to compromise once in a while. But that's a good question, actually. Yeah, well, it's yeah. an excellent question. You get this next one. One more. From Nicholas Clemens. The last one? Okay. Um, Nicholas asks, if I have the option to record in my closet or a more expansive guest room, what would be better? Well, I feel like I can answer this pretty go, clearly because right now I am essentially in a guest room. I'm in the <laughs> second bedroom of our two bedroom apartment. It is minimally treated right now. Um, unless I'm eating the mic as I am now, if I relax just a little bit, you very quickly hear the room reverberate, reverberating around me. But it's not bad. It's not bad. But if I use good mic technique, I can compensate for that. But the battery rooms acoustics the better, the more relaxed you can be at the microphone. You can be a little further away. You can have some more room to move around. Like Dan's room, he's quite far from the mic because we have that whole room acoustically tuned really nicely. And so Dan has a lot more leeway. He can relax and move back from the mic. It still sounds really nice. A closet, the advantage, really the only real advantage for a closet is the ease of getting started. Right. Most people have clothing in their closet that absorbs the echo. The more, the better. It's probably one of the quietest rooms, and if not the quietest room, because very few closets have windows. They're usually on the inside of the house. So there's a lot of practical reasons why a closet. But if you have a room that's larger, and more importantly, a quiet room that's larger. Good luck. I'm always going to pick the quiet, the larger room. I. It's great to have space above you, headroom, a room around the microphone, because that allows you to be further away from the mic, more relaxed, gesticulate, act. That's much harder to do in a really small space. So 
Yeah, all things being equal, I will always lean towards the bigger room. There's just more logistics involved in, in making that big room work. Yeah, I, I find that it's, uh, you know, and we, you and I both have clients in these tiny little places. We won't mention any names. Uh, it's like, it's not comfortable if you're like squoze into a place. Yeah. So, uh, you know. Got to be comfortable. Yeah. And you got to be able to record productively too. And, so it's, it can be a trade off. Right. People just need to learn to use their indoor voice because the louder you talk, the more the acoustics of the room come into play. So if I can hear it right now. Exactly. I mean, there's a little bit more room bounce when you e do that. Exactly. So if you talk quietly, it's not going to sound like that. And you're talking right. quietly into that 416, or that's a, or is that that's the the uh, the road mic you've this got. This one's the, the road, the NTG5. The, the NTG5. Similar. Yeah. It's you know, if you talk normally at a conversational tone, the acoustics of the room are not as critical. That's right. So that's right. When I did the ad earlier, you may have noticed the the source elements that. I was in salesman mode. <laughs> I was really projecting. And the room, you'll hear, the room is a lot more of, of a factor. You'll hear the room reverberating around me. Sue noticed it too. Yeah. But once once we get back into a conversation and we get up on the mic a little bit closer and take away that high, high energy, the room right. isn't as much of a factor. That's so right. There's a lot of things to consider there. Actually, I know that wasn't an easy, an easy answer. No, but I just want you to realize that you think about those things. Right. It's it's all part of the discipline. Uh, and Rose Klein is asking, are you guys going to do a, a, a mic technique special at any point? We got videos on that. We got videos. Uh, almost every show seems to be a mic technique <laughs> at some point. Exactly. It comes up in the conversation. But, uh, um, you know, you've, Rose, got a, yeah, you've got a YouTube kind of video on that, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the, it hasn't changed. You know, it's still the same. Yeah, thing. it's still pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for all those questions. If you've got a question for us, write to us at the guys at VOBS.tv and get your question on here. And you could have it answered by one of us. Whether it's the right answer or not, you know, try it and see. <laughs> I guess that's the only way to put it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the guys at VOBS. Dot, which way do I go? The, the guys at VOBS.TV. All right, we're going to be right back to wrap this up right after these messages. In a world of voices, one place wasn't VO Buzz Weekly. Voice over body shop, the better one. Getting into VO is quite an accomplishment. And accomplishing anything in the world of performance can be really tough. Getting great information is tough. Getting the right advice and mentoring is tough. Simply getting ahead is tough. And the best way to get ahead is to simply get started. Let's make it simple. To get started in voiceover, the best way is with VO Hero's free online course, Getting Started in VoiceOver. You'll learn everything you need to know to create a successful, satisfying, and profitable voiceover career. The link is really simple. Here it is. VOHeroes.com forward slash start. Again, that's VOHeroes.com forward slash start. Get ahead in voiceover simply by getting started. Go to VOHeroes.com forward slash start. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. 
Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voiceover Body Shop. And we're back, I think. Uh, next week on this very show, we have our good friend Joe Davis uh, coming back. Uh, he comes, with us, comes to us every year, usually after WovoCon. But we haven't, we're not doing that this year because we ain't doing anything. Uh, so he'll be joining us from his headquarters in Orlando. And uh, we'll talk about voice actor websites, which Anything is really know about web development. He, he is the guy. And SEO. And he really knows his stuff on that. So be prepared for that. Uh, let's see. Um, who are our donors this week? You might recognize these names. We might. I've read them many times, <laughs> and uh, that's for a reason, because they subscribe. Shelly Avellino, Thomas Pinto, George A. Whittem, that's my dad, Brian Page, Patty Gibbons, Diana Bertzel, Stephanie Sutherland, Antland Productions, Shauna Pennington Baird, Martha Kahn, and Stephen Chandler. All right. That one on the end might be a new name to me. It is. Somebody who's, who has found us. Our audience Thanks, has grown so exponentially over thank everybody. over over this this pandemic. <laughs> uh, hopefully, you'll stay on. Uh, okay, we need to thank, uh, of course, our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's Voiceover Essentials, Voiceover Extra, Source Elements, VOHeroes.com, VoiceActorWebsites.com, and JMC Demos. Uh, also, Jeff Holman for doing a great job in the chat room tonight. Thanks, Jeff. Yes, uh, Sue Merlino just making it happen behind the desk here and getting our software working the way it's supposed to work most of the time. And uh, and Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Well, you know, this isn't an easy business. There's a lot to learn. But as George and I like to say, if it sounds good, it is good. And that's all that really matters. I'm Dan Leonard. I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Yes. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.